Welcome to a very normal therapeutics training video. In this video, we'll talk about the two sample t-test. I'm Christian and I'm the CEO of this fictional pharma company. As my viewer, you're acting as my new employee and I'm in charge of training you in fundamental statistical concepts. This video is dedicated to explaining the basic concepts behind the two sample t-test. There will be a separate video for actually implementing the t-test in our administrative stuff aside, let's get started with the learning. Humans are really good at comparing things, especially when it involves people who are doing better than us. The act of comparison enables pharma companies to figure out if a new treatment is more effective than the current standard of care. It enables Amazon to figure out if this color of the buy button brings in more cash more than this one. Comparison gets harder when the two things we're comparing are random, but we're statisticians, so we have tools to deal with this. One of these tools is the two sample t-test. It's not the only tool, but it's a tool that most people are familiar with. Like its name suggests, something that's two sample deals with two samples, and by extension, two populations of interest. Comparison is a classic two sample problem. For simplicity, we'll focus our interest on comparing two populations based on a continuous outcome. Think blood pressure. It's just easier to visualize this test with the continuous outcome. Nothing stops us from considering a binary or count outcome. I mentioned earlier that it's more difficult to compare two things if they're random. What did I mean by that? Let's say that this PDF represents the range of blood pressures and associated densities that we might observe for one group, which we'll call group A. Then let's say that group B is slightly healthier than group A. For blood pressure, this means that lower values are better. For this example, let's say that the PDF for group B's blood pressure looks like this. Notice that they're mostly separate, but there's still a little bit of overlap. If we were to randomly pick one person from A and another from B and compare their blood pressures, the answer won't always be the same. Most of the time, we'll conclude that the person from B has better blood pressure than the person from A because their distribution is generally lower. However, it's unlikely, but still possible, that we can pick someone who is relatively healthy in A and someone who is unhealthy in B. These people would represent the opposite extremes in each group. If we drew our conclusion purely from this one unlikely comparison, we would mistakenly say that A is healthier than B. Statisticians want to avoid this, so instead of comparing individuals, we should aggregate the data of multiple individuals together and compare the typical outcomes of group A and B together. In the case of the t-test, we use the means of the two groups to represent a typical person in each group. In other words, the mean acts as a summary for all the information contained in the PDF. Other statistical tools for comparison may use another notion of typical, such as the median or mode. Since we're learning about a hypothesis test, we'll break things down in terms of the Null Hypothesis Significance Testing Framework, or NHST. If you don't know what that is, or need a refresher, take a look at the training video for the one sample t-test. We need four things to perform a hypothesis test. One a parameter of interest that represents a quantity we want to study for our research problem. In this case, it's a comparison of means. Two, a null hypothesis, which represents a statement about this parameter that we want to disprove. Three, a test statistic that's related to our parameter of interest. We calculate this statistic from actual data, and we eventually use it to make a decision to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And finally, the distribution of this test statistic assuming that the null hypothesis is true, otherwise known as the null distribution. Let's see how the two-sample t-test fits into this framework. With the two-sample problem, we have two population means that we'd like to compare, but we need a single parameter. Instead of considering the means separately, our parameter of interest will be the difference in the population means. For the null hypothesis, we should consider our research question. When we compare two things, we usually want to know if two groups are different. If two random groups are the same, then we expect their typical values to be the same. This is the same as saying that the difference between the two means is zero. The order of the means here doesn't matter, but once we have a null hypothesis, we have to be consistent in the calculation. So a natural null hypothesis is that the difference in the population means is equal to zero. Since the null hypothesis considers a difference of population means, a natural test statistic we might want to use is the difference in sample means we'll actually modify it a bit like we did with the test statistic of the one sample t-test. But now we need to figure out the distribution of this difference in sample means. Both of the sample means have their own distributions. If we can assume the central limit theorem holds for the both of them, 
and we will, then both of these sample means will have an asymptotic normal distribution centered at the population mean with the variance equal to the group's population variance divided by the number of people in the sample. So central limit theorem tells us the distribution of the individual sample means. If you can recall from the properties of normals training video, the normal distribution, asymptotic or not, is what's called a stable distribution. That is, sums of normals still have a normal distribution. To derive the mean and variance of this new normal, you just need to add the means and the variances, assuming that they're independent. The observant among you will notice that we need the distribution for the difference, not a sum. But thanks to the power of the normal distribution and its location scale property, this isn't a problem either. We can show that taking a difference in means produces a normal with these parameters. So this is the distribution of the difference in sample means. It's normal. In introductory statistics, the answer is almost always normal. But since we're dealing with the normal distribution, it's common procedure to standardize it. If we subtract the population difference from our starting statistic and then divide by the population standard deviation, then the distribution of this new standardized version of the statistic will be a standard normal. Since we'd like to work with the standard distribution instead, we'll have to change our test statistic as well. Instead of the difference in sample means, we need to calculate the standardized version of the statistic. But to do this calculation, we need to know the population variances, which we almost never know, so we need to estimate them instead. Since we need to estimate the variances, the sampling distribution is no longer a standard normal, but a t-distribution instead. t-distributions are parameterized by the mysterious degrees of freedom. Unlike the one sample case, the calculation for the degrees of freedom in the two sample case is complicated by the fact that there are two sample variances. Textbooks may provide you with rules and equations for deriving these different degrees of freedom, but I'm not gonna do that here for you. If you're performing a t-test, you're most likely doing it in R code. And if you're calculating it by hand, then stop watching this video because you're probably doing a midterm. People smarter than us have already coded these calculations into the t-test function in R, so we don't have to worry about them. With these four ingredients, we, we can easily calculate a p-value and make a decision to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. This was Fisher's approach to hypothesis testing. But you know, the p-value isn't the only method for making a decision concerning the null hypothesis. Statisticians Jersey Naiman and Egan Pearson devised a new method that I think is more intuitive and easier to learn than Fisher's p-value. Their contributions to the NHST were influential and deserve their own video. To be honest, it was originally a part of this video, but I'm not trying to make videos that are too long for my own sanity, so look out for this training video and the t-test code video in the future. If you like my stuff, then consider subscribing to the channel and signing up for my newsletter. You'll get videos straight to your inbox and some extra written content every Friday. So far, I've written about the most impactful habit I've adopted for progressing both my PhD and my YouTube channel and my 2024 goals. I'll see you in the next one. Hope you're having a great 2024.